Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're looking at doing high quality restorative dentistry, you know there are important steps you cannot miss and you want them to be highly predictable. And today I've got an amazing guest on here. You do not want to miss this. And we're going to be talking about the treatment plan, visualizing the treatment plan from wax up to definitive restoration part two, the added extra step that ensures high levels of predictability with Dr. Drew Kopp from the Dawson Academy. So do not miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show. Having so much fun doing this. And thank you guys for all of your suggestions, your shares, and um, all your feedback. This is so much fun. Up now over 32,800 followers and over 20,000 downloads just last week with um, iTunes. So thank you guys so much. And a lot of this, I attribute to the great guests. People are always like, I, I'm like, I don't know. I just, I, I'm looking for the best people in dentistry and I want to ask them the questions and get the answers straight from the masters themselves. So Drew, you're a big part of this and I'm so grateful that you're on, buddy. Uh, always good doing one of these sessions with you. I enjoy our time together. Absolutely. And you and I were together at Seminar One at the Dawson Academy uh, just a couple of weeks ago. That was so much fun, you know, just hanging out. We had dentists in there from all over the world, just starting that path. And I know who you are. I, I ask you to do this every single time, but we have a lot of new uh, watchers and listeners. Sure. What is the Dawson Academy and who's Drew Cobb? So, uh, so Dawson County is all focused on taking care of those patients that I think we struggle with most in our practice, those patients that need maybe a different pathway uh, to take care of than we were maybe taught in dental school or, or traditional dentistry takes care of. It's not that there's anything difficult to it, but kind of following this predictable protocol ensures success with these patients. And these are patients that you know, need more extensive dentistry, need aesthetic dentistry, maybe have some kind of oral facial pain things going on, but they, they require a different pathway to, to lead them to kind of their best long-term results. And that's the predictability that comes in. Treating these patients the way we were kind of taught that tooth by tooth dentistry, that's where we sometimes get in trouble. Things don't go the way we planned. Uh, maybe things don't fit as well. Things don't last as well. Other problems can happen. And those are those bad days in, in, in a dental practice. Uh, that's kind of what led me to the Dawson Academy, in all honesty. I mean, I practiced probably for about 10 years the way that I taught. I'm in D.C. and, and uh, you know, I went to Georgetown, had a great base education, but I struggled to take care of these patients. And, and, and I got really, really frustrated as a dentist. I mean, enough so, Kirk, that, I mean, you've heard my story before, but I was like 35 years old and I was thinking, how can I do this for another 20 or 30 years? Uh, right. Or I, gotta, I either got to get a lot better at what I'm doing or I got to find another career. And that's kind of when I, when I went down and listened to Pete for the first time and, and took the courses at the Dawson Academy. And it, it changed my life. It changed my life as a dentist. And, and, you know, that passion is back for what we do. I mean, I think dentistry is just an awesome profession. I love what we can do. But, you know, there, are, there is stress in it. And, and you know, we don't want to have those, those bad days, those days where things we've done. And, and listen, and we try hard, you know, but when things don't work out, I mean, we really kind of take it personally. It can really kind of affect your, your day or maybe a couple days. And we want to eliminate that. We want to kind of increase the predictability. We want our patients to have success for the long term. We want you to, to love what you're doing. And we want you to be able to identify which patients need another pathway to follow and maybe which patients it's okay to do that tooth by tooth dentistry because not everybody needs this pathway. So, uh, and I've been teaching with the Dawson Academy now for, gosh, about 10 years. I'm the director of the core curriculum. So we've really taken a lot of time, I think, hopefully, to make this process easier for dentists to learn and to implement into their practice because we want you to be successful. Yeah, you guys have certainly vetted this entire process. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of hours yeah. from some of the best dentists and put it together in a wonderful learning format. Dawson Academy changed my life too. But Drew, what we're going to be talking about today is so critical because a lot of young dentists think when you do more comprehensive dentistry, there's less stress, but there's actually more stress because expectations are higher, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, 
we want you to be able to, to match the patient's expectations or, or, or exceed them. Uh, especially if you get into you know aesthetic dentistry or more or more comprehensive type of cases, um, there's a lot riding on this. You know, in fact, right. your reputation rides on this. You know, at the end of this, um, you know, it's it's one thing to kind of get to the treatment plan and be able to visualize all the visualize all this sort of stuff, but it's another then to come through and do it. And yeah. and that's a little bit what we're going to talk about um, in our sequence here is is actually doing that predictably. Um, we want to be able to do what we say we are going to do and do it efficiently uh, and, and not have extra steps and not have surprises along the way. So hopefully by finding these protocols, when we actually get to do the dentistry, we're going to work efficiently. Uh, we're going to get you know, a great result for the patient. We're going to cut down on redos. And, and again, something my dad always said when I was a kid, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Uh, and, and that's very true, I think, with this kind of dentistry. And if you're able to do that, I think that's where your reputation as, as this, you know, we kind of refer to this go-to dentist. I think that's where your reputation starts to build. And, and, and your, your best referrals are going to be from patients uh, that you've worked on or maybe the specialists that have been involved in these multidiscipline cases. Uh, right. And you're going to start getting patients that way for this type of specialty patient. And that's just a great way to build your practice. Yeah, absolutely. And then last time, you know, you and I, we walked through all the details. So if you're watching this and you want yeah. to see Drew's protocols for prior to this, I encourage you to watch the show that we just did right before this uh, with Drew. But last time we talked about the wax up, the communication with the patient, you have the treatment coordinator come in, you're actually going to schedule all of this. And, you know, take us through kind of your thinking through the end of that appointment. Now you got to prepare to make sure this is done right. Right. And so take us through a little bit of the thinking, um, the prior appointment and sure. this one that we're going to be talking about. Sure. So following the protocols that we've talked about in our, in our previous sessions together, the examination, getting the approval from the, from the patient to continue forward, identifying the patient as what we refer to as especially patient, getting all the additional records, and then following a treatment planning protocol two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally uh, to visualize your ideal treatment. That's what we were talking about in the last session. So once you've kind of visualized your ideal treatment, it's fit within the budgetary constraints of that patient. We've created whatever sequence works for that patient. That's a really important part of this too, remember, is you want to present a treatment plan that's within the financial constraints and time constraints of the patient. So, you know, that's where, that's where we're the, uh, you know, we're working kind of for the patient. You know, we, this has to work for them, not necessarily for us. So you're kind of custom tailoring your treatment plan to that patient. And once you've gotten that, you've gone through this, your patient gets you the approval, you got to run through then, um, you know, what are, your, what are your appointments? How many appointments? How are you going to do this? What are your time constraints? Do you have specialists involved? And if the specialists involved, let's get, the, get, get everything scheduled. So if you kind of remember last time, at the end of this, once I've run through things with a patient, my scheduler comes in. And if a patient has to go see one of my interdisciplinary team, she'll get on the phone right away and call and make that appointment. I want everything scheduled when the patient's here. I don't want them to leave with the treatment plan. It's up to them because it's easy to lose those patients then. They get home, they get busy, they forget about things. So I want that scheduled now. And when I know when my, maybe my specialists are scheduled, then we can schedule my time. So right. the big thing here is we're getting to what we want to do. I mean, ultimately, we want to do the dentistry. And these previous steps, although you could look at it, Kirk, and say, gosh, that, that seems like a lot of extra time. It really isn't the way that we've talked about it. But where you save time is what we're going to talk about soon. When we're actually now doing the dentistry, which is, you know, as a restorative dentist, you know, I love to do this. But I want to mm -hmm. kind of get in and get out. I want to work as efficiently as I can. Uh, and by having the 2D and then the 3D, it's my roadmap to do this efficiently. So I'm going to use that, and that's going to help me do my preparations, my prototypes, verify everything, work with my laboratory so when my definitive restorations come back. It's not one of those days where you say a little prayer ahead of time and wonder how it's going to go. You know it's going to work because you put in all of the checklists and verifications to make sure it's going to happen. 
Yeah, there's so many way, so many things I love about the way that you teach, but it keeps coming back to the same principle. There's no less expensive way to do anything or better way to do anything than to do it the right way the first time as added evidence of your specialist. Because when you think about that, like you might be a young dentist watching this going, you mean you schedule the endo in your office? Yes, because it's unnatural at first, but when you realize you can control some of these elements and predictably goes up, Everybody wins, the patient wins, and you don't have that vein in your neck coming out when you can't find out where the patient's at and all those kind of things. The great things about dentistry, too, is that with this, you know, you can pick and choose what, what procedures you want to do. Like, I, I predominantly do restorative work, you know, and I work with oral facial pain patients, just what's happened over the years. But my perio and my endo and my surgery, I send all that out. One, I don't have to fill my schedule with that. I'm very, very lucky that I can do that. Two, I work with great specialists and I want that done to the best of their ability. But if I was in an area that I wanted to do the surgery, I wanted to place my own implants, I want to do the endo, it's the same thing. You, you add that in, that's, that's part of your plan already. How much time do you need to do it? You know, schedule yourself to the highest level so you can get a great end result. And, and you, know, you just move on from there. Yeah. So take us through this. You know, as you design this process for yourself, what are some of the things that you would say are keys to what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think the keys are actually following the process and sticking to it. So, I mean, we've mapped out everything. And this goes back to, to, to what Pete was doing decades ago. And I think, you know, Pete's probably, Pete Dawson is probably the most successful restorative dentist I've ever seen in my life. He's had results that have lasted decades upon decades. Uh, and his principles and his foundation has been out there for a long, long time. So a lot of these principles are built on that, but we've certainly modernized and added to it as time goes on, the aesthetic component, how that ties in. Um, but the, the basic protocols are the same. Where you tend to get into trouble, and, we, and we've created checklists for every step along the way. If we have a checklist and you follow it, you can't get into trouble. Here's when you get into trouble. And I've done this myself. You know what? I've done this enough now. I've been doing this for years. I know where I'm going. I don't have to follow the checklist. Inevitably, I'll miss something. And it always comes back to burn you. So, oh, yeah. so I think you know, the most important advice would be there's a reason for the checklist. There's a reason for the process. It works. It's worked for a long time. Follow the process. Yeah, and if you're fighting this and you're a man, realize how many times you go to the store and your spouse tells you get this and you leave yeah. off two things. You're like, darn it, yeah. you need the list to do this effectively. <laughs> now, it, it's funny. It reminds me a little bit of dental school because I remember as a freshman in dental school, first and second year you're in dental school, and your instructors are giving you whatever assignment it is. You're in the labs, and they're teaching you how to do something. Inevitably, I did it myself. Oh, I know a better way to do this. I, you know, you're, you're in your first or second year and you already know a better way than your instructors. We all did it. And, and, mm -hmm. and it always ends up with a bad result one way or another. So, yeah. so follow the process. There's history behind this that works. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So kind of talking about that first slide, slide 11. So the important part then of this visualization process, the 3D visualization, is you've done the wax up. And again, uh, just to recap a little bit from last time, is you've waxed up whatever it is you determined is your first uh, session of treatment. So if we're going to sequence, this is our first sequence, meaning don't wax up upper, large, upper arch and lower arch, everything, if that's not what you're going to do in the first sequence. We want to wax up that first sequence. There's ways that we can place interim restorations on other teeth sometimes if we need it. But that way, uh, how we're going to proceed is accurate for what we're doing. Um, and you only have to make that mistake once, and I already did the research for you, so don't do it. So, so from the 3D wax up where we visualized ideal aesthetics, ideal function, we've created our treatment plan, we're going to make these stent guides off of that. And the beauty on this is the, the 3D wax up is basically in space exactly where we want those teeth to be for aesthetic and functional reasons. We've already worked it out. And so we're going to use that as our guide. So we're going to end, so that's basically our end result. We're going to use those as a prep guide, not doing the preps the normal way, maybe when we're in school where you just take off, you know, a millimeter and a half, 360, and on the incisal edge, because there are going to be some places if we're moving teeth or lengthening teeth that, that you really don't need much prep at all. So having these prep guides lets us prep um, 
uh, precision preparations exactly where we want them to be. Uh, so we have a, a couple different guides so that we can do the preparations accurately, and it happens a lot faster. And we know that we've got the right amount of reduction on the teeth for what we want in the end. And we're also then going to use that guide as what we're going to say for our provisionals or our prototypes. So now we can make really good prototypes quickly that are going to be aesthetically pleasing and accurate and functional. And we're not going to need a lot of adjustment on these things at the end. It's the beauty of the system, especially when you're doing anterior teeth, multiple teeth. You know, I think as young doctors go through this too, figure out what you're comfortable with. So, um, you know, we're not saying here that you have to prep an arch. Maybe you're comfortable prepping four teeth. Well, then you can do your treatment plans that way. Maybe you're okay with six teeth or eight teeth. You figure out what you're comfortable with, and then you can design your treatment plans from there. There's so many options we have now with interim restoration. So, you know, don't get yourself out of your comfort zone. You know, with mm -hmm. time, it'll build. Um, right. But again, make this first sequence something you're comfortable with, gets what the patient's looking for. These guides will help ensure the predictability. Outstanding. And then, Kirk, the, the next slide is basically kind of how we'd use some of these guides. And not real rocket science to it, but on the left, and this was a, this was a patient that had old crowns that we had to remove that, that are getting replaced. It was a, a trauma thing. So the first one, that incisal edge guide, basically makes sure that we have the right reduction on the incisal edge. And this is one that's really important because oftentimes we might be lengthening for aesthetic reasons. And if we're lengthening a tooth a millimeter or so, that means we don't have to reduce very much. So, so then this guide then lets us see right off um, before we do too much reduction. Because if you do too much reduction, then we have all this extra unsupported ceramic which is more prone to breakage and fracture and problems like that. The middle one basically is just making sure we get the right reduction around the facial. And we kind of cut that one in three different planes. So you can see it towards the incisal, the middle of the tooth, and then on the gingival third. But basically it's just ensuring that we get the proper amount of reduction so we have enough ceramic for aesthetics and, and function for the patients. And then the clear one is a good one because it kind of lets you see 360 degrees around the teeth. The shell, again, is based on that wax up of where we want those teeth to be at the end. It lets us check to make sure everything's parallel. We have good reduction, 360 degrees. You can poke a hole in that one sometimes, too, and use a perio probe to go in and measure if you want so that you really have the right uh, reduction there. But again, this is ensuring predictability. Let's get these preparations done quickly and accurately. And again, it's not like I was taught in dental school where you just a millimeter and a half all the way around the teeth. So some of these teeth, there's going to be almost no reduction in certain areas, depending upon where we're changing their position in space. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question about the reduction because this is a big problem between yeah. dentists and the lab. Having a lab person that is also your coach yeah. can teach you about reduction, correct? Like what are some of the things you've learned from your lab guys well, on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, we tie their hands basically, you know, so, so let's just say you did a case maybe and, and you didn't do this wax up. You didn't envision where it went in space beforehand and you're prepping Basically, that means you're, we're really guessing. And, mm -hmm. and now we're going to go to them and say, we want length here. We want to improve the aesthetics. We got to improve the function. And, and they don't have room for things. Or, or they've really got to over bulk something. It changes the contours of the teeth. It changes the looks of the teeth. Teeth don't look like teeth. I mean, you, you got to do this together. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that you want to do is, let's say you did it that way. Then you have the lab calling you and says, I don't have this. Like, you didn't reduce enough here or we knew this. Now you've got to call your patient and say, hey, by the way, I need you to come in and I've got to prepare the teeth again in certain areas, but that means you've got to take a new impression. So and take another shot. There you, well, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to numb them up again. Yeah, and, you've yeah. got to, and, and, so, and your patient says, well, doctor, what, why? What, what happened? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Let's do what we say we're going to do and do it efficiently. And that's, again, right. it's the beauty of this system. So the minute something like that happens, either you have to tell the lab to, oh, we'll just go for it, do the best you can. So now you've tied their hand behind the back and you've, and you've, you've then compromised your end result. Is it enough to ruin the case? Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. 
but you certainly don't want to get into this dentistry and right off the bat start compromising your end result. And, and if you have to go back and, and honestly to do it right, you, you know, you, you, you got to re-prepare or give your lab what they needs, but you're right. That means you got to anesthetize them again. You got to take another final impression. But here's the other thing, Kirk, how much time is it going to take you to do that? Well, there's another two hour appointment. So, right. so, and that's for free. So you know this better than I do. What's the cost of that to your practice to, to have to reschedule an appointment that you really shouldn't need? The cost is called stomach lining. Yeah. So you uh, you don't want to do that. Now, you and I, this is a con consistent theme that we talk about a lot. Most people could do better if they just slowed I agree. Down. Like I agree. You know, there are too many young dentists. And, you know, this happens to everybody. You get so much in your schedule and you feel under the pressure. There are so many good arguments for just slow down and give yeah. yourself a little bit extra time and do it right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing to think about with, with this kind of patient, this is kind of what we, we categorize our patients, general patient, especially patient. The especially patient is definitely the patient you need to slow down with. Mm -hmm. um, you, can't, you can't race through this. Uh, again, I'm going to say I really don't think it's a lot of extra time, um, mm -hmm. but you got to do this whole workup because then again, we're working more efficiently. But if you look at your schedule and you know we all have um, you know, your productivity, what are you producing a month, a week, a day? If you have one of these, what I'll refer to especially patients, and a lot of times if you're doing restorative work, it is a, a multi-restorative patient. Again, whether it's four units, six units, eight units, whatever it is, in my practice, you know, it tends to be a multi-unit thing. You know what, that one patient, Kirk, I've made, I've exceeded my production for the day. So right. why rush it? You know, wh right. why? I don't want other patients around it. We call it, um, I'm not that smart, so I have to simplify things. In my office, we call it primary care and secondary care. Primary care is the long appointment for this kind of patients. I want it pre-blocked in my schedule. I do it in the morning. I want to be fresh. It's three hours. And those patients, when they're ready, we put into this block. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not seeing two or three patients at a time. I don't want anything else on my schedule for those couple hours because I want to concentrate on what I'm doing. After yeah. that, for the, for the rest of the day that I work, if it's those general patients, I can work two operatories. I'll go back and forth. I can pick up the pace and, and that's fine. So, but you got to identify for this patient, do not rush through it. Take your time. And you know what? For, for, you know, if you're first starting out, do this. After you've done one of these patients, if you want, take an hour break. You deserve right. it. Go have mm -hmm. a cup of coffee. Go chill. Go, you know, go have lunch or something. You know, Pete used to talk about that all the time. And I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. He would, he would do this and, then he'd go to lunch afterwards, you know, just yeah. got to relax and have a great time. It's like when I first heard that, that was so foreign of a concept for me. Uh, but it's the greatest thing in the world. And you do you know? give yourself, I can't remember who said this, but there was a Dawson Academy dentist who said to me, he goes, lunch is going to taste good today. Yeah, that's you know? exactly right. Yeah. You know, if you do one of those patients and everything works the way that, 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 that we, we want it to enjoy your success. You know, right. take a little time, take a little break, and then come back and, you know, put the roller skates on and, and work two chairs and double hygiene and, you know, whatever you got going. That's fine. Right, 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 right. So where do we go next after so, this? So the next thing then, you know, a, a, again, is I really like doing this kind of dentistry. So you, so you work with the preparations efficiently, and then the next slide, um, you know, what we call the approved provisionals. So these are, I mean, this is just Mary. It's just kind of a random case. Mary was a kind of an oral facial pain patient, and she, and she had a lot of wear on the anterior. She wanted to show more teeth. So this is the segment that we did, the first sequence for her. So basically, we've done the preparations the way that we said. We've had the prep reduction guides. We did all that. These prototypes were custom made for her from the wax up. Uh, and I'm telling you, this is a great technique. It really works. Um, you know, doing anterior prototypes, I used to, it could kind of be a, a scary thing, especially when you're first doing this. How are we going to give the patient an aesthetic result? We're dealing with their front teeth. And I, and I think the, the, uh, the anxiety level goes up sometimes as we're working on CRT. So this really helps, I think, with that and the predictability. But then what happens is the patient will come back, you know, 48, 72 hours later. They're not numb anymore. And we're just going to recheck these, you know, without the lips being numb anymore. We get to check the function and the aesthetics, phonetics, make sure everything's working for the patient because now we can make changes in plastic and it's easy to make changes in the plastic. 
again, we got a checklist to verify how we're going to go through and check these things. It's not rocket science. Just follow the checklist. You know, yeah. so we're going to verify the length and it's easy to make changes here. Right. Now, I'm just going to add this because you probably wouldn't suggest this. You vetted these checklists. So if you're a dentist watching this, you're like, I need checklists. You yep. actually created a whole uh, electronic diagnostic wizard, which is a software. You just correct. follow your checklist, just, correct? Correct. Just follow. Yes, exactly right. I mean, we, you know, we had this as an analog version some years ago, mm -hmm. which works great. I mean, it works great. But um, it took longer. And so we created basically the digital version, which is basically the Dawson Diagnostic Wizard. So everything you and I have been talking about for all of these sessions is in one place. I, I personally, now, you know, I got to asterisk this because I Wait. developed this with John Cranham. Yes. So, so Actually, it's in two places. Yeah. One of them is in the software and the other one is in this one. Oh, yeah. That's so, the, great, the, the new book. That's an awesome yeah. book. Yeah. So I got the first copy. So again, you know, and I, I love pushing stuff that I believe in. This is absolutely something you have to get. I got one of the first copies with a signed card from Pete Dawson, which is awesome. And this thing is fantastic. So I actually went through, I didn't read the whole thing on the flight yeah. home, but I'm like, everything you'd ever want to know about high quality, predictable dentistry, we'll put a link in there, but get it. Drew, you're one of the contributing ed editors yeah. to this, yeah. right? Yeah. Just fantastic. So yeah. keep going. Yeah. Well, you know, Pete wanted to do that as kind of what he called the Reader's Digest version of Complete Dentistry. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got his book, best-selling dental book, you know, of all time from TMJ to, to Smile Design. And this is, you know what, I just need to know how to do X. And, and, and so that's, that's this resource of this book is, is trying to make that a little bit easier for people. So, um, yeah, but, and the wizard was one of those things we developed. Again, just try to make this whole process easier. Um, yeah. uh, so I think it's great. So, um, you know, the approved provisionals, again, these prototypes, it's all made from the wax up, but, you know, we're going to verify them. And the next slide, basically, again, is just kind of that checklist. And, and this goes actually back to Pete, because when we start dealing with aesthetics and anterior teeth, uh, there's a reason for every contour on a central incisor. The emergence profile, the middle profile, the incisal third, the concavity on the lingual from the stop to the incisal edge the shape of the cingulum, there's reasons for all that. And all that's going to come into play with function, aesthetics, and phonetics. And mm -hmm. so we can alter that. You know, so, you know, if you go back sometimes and you know, I'll take Mary's case, for instance, because she wanted more length. Going through our checklist, 2D, 3D, let us visualize how much length we wanted to add to her. There, there are steps that give us that. But these, all these things are guesstimates. And so let's say for whatever reason, I guess wrong. So let's say that I lengthened Mary's teeth a millimeter and a half and she only needed, uh, or she, or she needed, uh, maybe I, I did longer. I did two and a half millimeters. She only needed a millimeter and a half. So when I get them into the mouth and I go to check them here, what if they come back and they're too long? Mm -hmm. Well, because we're verifying everything, it's really easy to take about a half a millimeter, a millimeter off. I mean, you just take a disc out. And you can reduce that in about 30 seconds to a minute, right? Right. So, right. so, so we're not going to definitive restorations yet. We're not going to make ceramics that, are, that don't fit her face. We're able to adjust this. And what if it had been the reverse? What if I made them too short and I want to add a little bit more length? It takes a couple minutes longer, but we can still add composite to our ceramics to lengthen them again. So right. we, what this does is the beauty on this appointment, and you don't want to rush through it, but it gives us the ability to really nail everything. The aesthetics are spot on. The function is spot on. Everything is there. And now all we got to do with that is communicate that to the laboratory. So yeah. you're, not, you're not writing a lab script to your lab and say, uh, shade A2, uh, teeth, you know, 4 to 13, whatever it is. You got to give them some information. And, right. and, and that, that's, again, going to be one of the keys with your lab. Yeah. Now, can I ask you, the verification process from our viewpoint, that's one that gets skipped over a lot. Just, and maybe when you were early in this process, you were like, okay, I caught a lot of things. And then your errors come a little bit tighter, but you still catch yourself. Even at this stage of the career, you're like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa I'm way off here. You know? This, that, that step, that approved provision, I can't tell you how important it is. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, there's, there's nothing on that checklist that a doctor can't do. Right. You just don't think about it or you don't go about it in that order or you don't take the time to do it. Um, but it's what's going to assure that when we go in and deliver those definitive restorations at the end, pretty much what we're looking for, Kirk, is did we nail the aesthetics? 
You know, mm -hmm. the global and the macro aesthetic should be spot on. How did we do with the micro aesthetics? You know, do we want a little more halo effect or lucency or is the shade off or, or surface texture, those sort of things. So um, that's really kind of what we're looking for at the end. Much, much different than, you know, what I used to be. Like, I had no idea how they're really going to go or not, you know. I mean, I used to call it the Hail Mary delivery, you know. Prep and, prep and pray, right? <laughs> prep and pray, yeah. So, in fact, the, the, the next slide then is, is the lab communication checklist. So there's a checklist that we're going to verify the approved provisionals. And then there's a checklist just to make sure you get the lab everything they need to do their job, okay? Again, it's not complicated, but you need models of the approved provisionals. You need stump shades. You need all your shade photos. You need your working models mounted. And remember, we're mounting everything on our articulator. I mean, go back to those earlier ones. None of this is happening on that lab articulator. This is, this is a facebow mounted case. So we have the right arc of closure. We're starting from centric relation. And now we can switch and interchange all these models. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And again, this is where the predictability comes in and just eliminates all the guesswork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any pitfalls in this whole process that you want to point out? No. Again, probably the next slide. And, and so slide 16 here. So this is from the lab communication checklist. And this is what you want your lab to do. So somewhere here in this process, I think just like working with your interdisciplinary team, I consider my lab part of my interdisciplinary team. So I think if you have these conversations ahead of time, what it is I'm looking for, what I expect, I, you know, we're all on the same page. And I don't really have to ask for these things anymore because my lab knows that I want them. And basically what we're getting right now that they need to do, and they'll make these from the approved provisional models. This is why it's so important. Now, remember, we've just gone through a checklist. We verified aesthetics, function, and phonetics on my approved provisionals. We duplicate, we take an impression of that. You know, we get that so we can cross mount it to the, our models. And they're going to use that as a guide to make the definitive restorations. And here's the two things they need to do. One is on the left is the incisal guide table. And basically what that is, is that will allow them to create the lingual contours of the definitive restorations. That's function. From the stops to the concavities as we go into protrusion, right and left working movements. So that's created, that, that jig there is created from the approved provisional models. Now when they put the working model on the stacking the ceramics, they go through those same movements and they can replicate what we already proved in the prototypes. The one on the right is the incisal edge stent. And basically, again, that's made from the prototypes. And remember, we put a lot of work into figuring out in space exactly where those anterior teeth should be vertically and horizontally. So they make that from the prototypes. And again, when they're stacking the ceramic or creating the anterior restorations, there's their goal. Stick those edges right where, you know, right where we had them for the prototypes. Now, the other thing that happens about this is here's your verification. So when it comes back to the lab, how do I know before the patient gets in there? Because and, 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 I don't like to try things and have to send it back to the lab. Mm -hmm. So how do I know that they followed what I said? Well, one is both of these things have to be with the case when it comes back to me. Because if it's not in the case, they didn't follow it. And remember, it's really, really important on maxillary and anterior teeth that there is a concavity on the lingual surface from your centric stop to the incisal edge. It's not an inclined plane. And when they don't follow this, you tend to get that, which means the lingual surface is overbulked. If it's overbulked, we've impinged on an envelope of function. Patients can get uncomfortable. Anterior teeth can get loose. They can wear. Restorations can break. The lower teeth, same thing. The teeth can wear. So, so we need them to follow this. Um, and the second thing is, is I will, just like I have here on this photo, I'll put the restorations on with that incisal matrix, and I'll make sure that those incisal edges are where I want them to be. And if they're not, I'm going to send the case back. I'm going to have them correct it before I bring the patient in, numb them up, take my prototypes off, and try in a case I know is not going to work. Mm -hmm. So it saves me kind of an extra step. Yeah, I've got to call my patient and say, hey, there's going to be a delay or something else. But I'd much rather do that than have to try them in, not like them, and then have to send them back. 
Absolutely. You see where the lips end up. You can see where it all comes together. Absolutely. Exactly right. Exactly right. So I think, you know, you're always asking for pearls, and that would probably be the next slide, um, is that predictable laboratory design is predicated on precisely contour prototypes. I mean, we can't stress this enough. Um, you know, there's a reason you go through the checklist. There's a reason you go through the 2D and the 3D. That's the driver for your treatment plan and how you want to solve the patient's problems. It's the driver on what your fees are going to be, what your time constraints are going to be, what specialists are involved, et cetera, et cetera. But doing that approved provision, putting that time and effort into the prototypes and really, really verifying is what's going to make this whole predictability part um, flow so much easier for you and make this process, I mean, honestly, th this is fun. This is a great way to practice dentistry. Uh, and yeah, you know, when you're doing more teeth and anterior teeth, th th there is more stress. But I think as you, as you get used to this system and the protocols, man, it's a great day. It's just a great way to care for your patients. Absolutely. And I'm going to go back to this because we talk about this all the time is the importance of training your team around this because yeah. a lot of dentists might watch this and say, well, I don't have to do everything. No, the team is a huge integral part of this entire process all the way through. Absolutely. And you've got to train them. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, that's such a, a, a key part. So when you're going through this and if you locked, looked at a lot of the sessions you and I have been doing on this process from start to now, I'm, I mean, I get it. I think the dentist can look at it and say, you know, Drew, Kirk, it's just too much time. I, I, I don't have that much time. I'm in a busy practice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, really, it really isn't. So if we go back to the beginning and kind of go through what it is you're responsible for. So I would say uh, the most important thing, the foundation of this whole thing is, is somewhere in there you got to be able to do a thorough, complete exam. This is more than the perio charting and the, and, and, uh, the clinical charting. This is all that other stuff, the TMJ occlusal exam. So the doctor has to do that. And I'll say that's an hour. And then at the end of that, the doctor figures out, what's this patient? Is it the general patient or especially patient? Uh, so you answer that question. You're also going to answer based on the examination. And this goes back to something Pete's talked about forever, that, you know, we're the physician emasculatory system. You know, it's up to us to interpret the data. So you got to do the exam, interpret the data. So four things we ask for. What's the patient type? And the second thing is, and, and this is, this is the kind of the, the big change, I think, in dentistry and maybe the future dentistry is the next thing we want to answer, Kirk, is can the patient breathe? Do they have an right. acceptable airway? Because if they don't have an acceptable airway, we're not doing the dentistry and stuff yet. Patients got to breathe before we start doing all this stuff that we like to do. Uh, and, and what pathway do we go back to ensure that? The next thing we're going to ask is, are their joints healthy? You know, is this a patient that the joints are healthy and stable enough and the patient's comfortable? that we're okay to proceed with irreversible dentistry? Or is there something that we got to go and treat and stabilize before we start doing things? Because joints that aren't stable, um, that means that as anything changes at joint level, the occlusion changes. So now mm -hmm. you're in quicksand. So, so, and here's the good thing. It doesn't happen the majority of the time. But, but all you need to do is get burned by it once. Uh, and those patients can be uncomfortable and, and um, in pain. And, and that's a really bad patient to miss on. So we want you to be able to identify those patients and maybe at the beginning know which patients to stay away from. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to look a little bit more closely. Remember, we categorize the patients as one, two, or three. One can be that general patient. Tooth by tooth dentistry is good. Second category is what we're talking about with all this. The third category is something going on with the joint. Let's just treat the joint first and then we can proceed with them. So that exam is the doctor. Once you go back and we're actually going through the process here, Kirk, and we're going to get the records and the photos and the models, the only thing the doctor has to do is get a CR record. Mm -hmm. For a patient that's mostly asymptomatic, that takes you five or ten minutes. Your assistants take the impressions, the photos, they mount the case, they put it together. The next thing you have to do then is to go through the checklist, the 2D and the 3D. I find that fun. That could take you from, I don't know, 15 minutes to an hour, I guess, depending upon the case. Um, but if it's a bigger case, that's a pretty good use of your time, isn't it? Absolutely. I will also add this. They're going to do a better job than you will at yeah. all those other things eventually if, if you give them the space to learn it. Exactly. And then the approved provisionals, you're going to check the checklist, but then they're going to retake whatever photos you need and the approved provisional models and everything else. So, 
you know, a little time up front on cases like this, gosh, it's so worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as it saves you going back and having to redo something. Well, I think some of it is relative to age because when you're young, you think you have all the time in the world. And when you get older, you go, I don't. And every yeah. minute counts, not it only does. for you, but for the patients and your team members. So Absolutely. that is one of the keys. And so the next slide is kind of circling around here a little bit, too. So we talk about this. And this is kind of the process in a nutshell to a certain way is that in a certain way, we look at the cases four times for predictability. So. The first time we, we talk about, you know, is in our mind. And, and that's, that's the 2D checklist. It's going through the mounted models and the photos and making your decisions on functions and aesthetics and, you know, what changes we want to make. The second time is, is in the wax, like we talked about last time, where we're actually going to take what we came up with in the 2D and let's just kind of prove it. Let's just do it on the models. Uh, and again, whatever sequence uh, that you're going to do. The third time we're going to do is, you know what, we're, we're going to take it again. And we're going to make sure and verify it in the mouth, that's the prototypes. And, and again, it lets us make changes if needed before the definitive restoration. It proves that what we wanted to do is the right solution. And if it's not, you know what, we can make corrections now. And then we communicate with the lab, then we get to the definitive restorations. And again, that's where the predictability comes in. Yeah, and you and I were talking about this beforehand. We're so quick to go from in our mind to definitive restorations, right? You just want to get there. Yeah. But that's, you, yeah, you got to kind of enjoy the journey to there. That's how we're, I mean, you know, I guess I don't want to speak bad about dental school. There's a lot you got to learn in dental school, but that's kind of how you're taught. That's tooth by tooth dentistry. You look at it, here's the problem, here's the end result. It mm -hmm. just is not the right way to do these specialty patients. And, you know, sometimes we get lucky, but all you got to do is get burned once or twice. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a bad day. It's costly. It hurts your reputation, everything else we've talked about before. So the, in your mind, this is what you want to get. I want to do this every patient, every time. Uh, and again, it's where the predictability comes in. It's the efficiency come in. Again, I would argue that I don't think it's a lot of extra time. A little bit of time spending and planning something makes you work so much more efficiently um, when you're actually doing the treatment on the patient. And it's a, you know, it's a really, it's a wonderful feeling to go through and have a patient that has maybe some complex needs and identifying what the issues are, uh, finding the solutions, having your patient say yes, and then doing the work and having the end result that you feel proud of. That's what's great about dentistry. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's an awesome day. It's an awesome feeling. I think that's why a lot of us do what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, when you get started, you solve little simple problems, but you would hope that as you progress through your career, you get more complex problems, it adds more value in people's lives, and it's so cool. Now, Absolutely. one more thing I just want to sure. add about sure. the way you teach. You yeah. you not only do classroom, but you do a lot of hands-on, too. Yeah. So as a dentist, you might be watching this going, okay, somebody's going to have to help me and watch me. You, I've watched yeah. you yeah. look over the shoulder and go, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do <laughs> like. So you've got a good combination, a good yeah. hybrid approach to not only the mindset and the process, but working with your hands too. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great point. Um, and, and and I think I know for me when I went through it, that the hands-on classes, <laughs> excuse me, are the things that really made the difference. So you can sit in a big conference room and we can tell you how to do this or how to get a centric record or how to take these photographs and everything else. But to really get the confidence and do it and, and know you can do it, I think the hands-on classes are great. So, you know, in our core, we've broken up a lot of those segments that we think you really got to get the skill set on. We have in hands-on classes. So, and that would be, um, you know, the first one is, is records and treat, uh, the records appointment uh, and the exam. So how to do the exam, what's important on the exam and why, uh, how to take the photographs. But really what's important is you got to get these cases mounted in centric. This is a technique Pete's taught for a long time. Um, it, it really is not difficult. But to do it, do it with a group of people for, you know, a day and a half, two days, you're, you're doing bimanual manipulation, you're getting centric records. Here's a cool thing about this, though, is that, um, so we have patients, you bring your own models, so, that, you know, the doctors are patients and back and forth. So at the end of this two and a half day hands-on, um, each doctor has gotten multiple centric relation records on their own case, and they've mounted. So you get to go home with your case mounted in centric and you know, we're, so we all have problems that we don't want to admit. So, so you get to see they're staring at you. But one, one thing that we do is, you know, so is a centric record verifiable? 
you know, if three different people take them, are they all going to be the same? Well, one of the cool things about the Whitmix articulator we use is that they have something called a center check, which is basically you take the upper member off and there's these grids and with little pinpoints. Um, and so we can put three different records and push those pinpoints into the grid. And if they're all the same, those pinpoints will go right into the same hole. Now, I've been doing this for a number of years in, in the U.S. and abroad. And, and I, we always count it. How many, how many patients, how many records, how many were on or how many were off? Almost every class, the predictability is over 95%. Now, these are doctors that two days ago we had never done bimanual manipulation. 95% pinpoint accuracy, multiple doctors, multiple records that's spot on. So here's what I did after teaching these classes. So when I first went through it, we did bimanual manipulation only to get, get the record. And now we use a Lucia jig just to help us be more accurate. And, and it's, it's a little bit like training wheels for CR, but that's how we teach it now. It's been so accurate that I actually, after seeing this and the predictability that we got from the doctors going through, I just started using a Lucia jig myself with every patient I get. If it's so accurate, why am I not going to do it? It just lets me verify that I know that I'm there. And on some patients, if it's, if it's a really complex ca uh, case sometimes, I'll do two records and I'll get out my center check and I'll make sure I'm starting in the right place. Because yeah. How if, long does it take you typically? Just a couple minutes? Yeah, yeah. So you put a Lucia jig in, you give the patient about five, ten minutes at the most to deprogram. Takes you a couple of minutes to make the record and you're done. You know, and if I was going to do another record, you know, a couple more minutes there. So, and then remember your staff's mounting everything and doing everything else from that. So, but little things like that. And then, you know, the treatment planning course, hands-on, different cases where you get to go through the checklist, the 2D, the 3D, equilibration. Um, you know, that's, again, one of those things that is just not taught well. And I think doctors sometimes are uncertain on what is equilibration, where do I adjust. And equilibration, you know, equilibration is a precision adjustment. It is not mm -hmm. mutilating teeth. It's not yeah. knocking. And it can be off. additive too. You and it know? can be additive. You are good. It can be additive. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. some of these things when I sit and listen to you guys, I'm like, oh my yeah. gosh, because you think of equilibration, you're just yeah. you're burning down teeth. And that's yeah. not true. It's you know, a lot of it's hundreds of a millimeter. I mean, it's amazing, a little adjustment here and there. And you're right. The other thing that the equilibration does, and again, why working on the models is so important, is you might sometimes think that that it's all reductive or additive, or maybe there are some teeth that we have to equilibrate more than we want. That means it's not equilibration. It means it's a restoration. So now we get to alter our treatment plan. So mm -hmm. that's why these steps are so, are so, so important for that. And then the last hands-on we do, which is, which is awesome, a lot of times it's with um, Scott Finley, who's with, um, you know, he's an examiner with the AACD. Uh, he, he's just awesome. Um, but it's aesthetic foundation over to it. It's the stuff we were kind of talking about today. Getting, you know, doing the preps, the, the, the prototypes, verifying them, adjusting them. It's a whole, whole class of that. I think the hands-on then just give you a little bit of that extra confidence that when you go to the patient, you know, I can do it. Yeah, absolutely. People yeah. always ask me, are you a dentist? I go, nope, I just hang out at the Dawson Academy. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's just, you, yeah. you're smarter just being there. So yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Now you and I are going to be together. One of the questions that comes up is, okay, well, first of all, if I'm a young dentist, where do I start? You and I are going to be together at seminar one. Actually, this time we're doing it in DC. I know. I okay. I, so yeah. the date on that is May 10th and 11th. Tell us what that is. What's so, seminar one? So seminar one is, uh, you, well, you'll love seminar one because Kirk starts things off. So, you know, it's, it's high energy. He gets you pumped up. We're loving dentistry. And then we'll come in and kind of, kind of fill in the how to. So, uh, seminar one basically is, is the overview of complete dentistry, the stuff we've kind of been talking about in, in this session together and we've talked about in all of our sessions. So from, from seeing that patient when they first call your office to going through all these steps to get into the definitive restoration, it's kind of our lecture overview on those processes. So, um, uh, I, it's, a, it, you know, it's a great course. I remember when I listened to it, it's like a light bulb went off in my head. Uh, and remember, I was pretty frustrated. You know, I was looking for a better way to do it. I was struggling with this kind of patience. I, I didn't know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, and so I listened. It's like you know, one is God. I wish I had learned this earlier. But also, this is what I'm missing. This this is what I want to do. Now, 
I was so motivated for change and I was so motivated to try to be better at, at, at what we do in dentistry that I just, I just signed up for everything. I just, I, I couldn't get through the curriculum fast enough. And I, and I know that doesn't work for everybody because, you know, there are expense with these courses. You are away from your offices. You know, you are leaving your loved ones, you know, so there definitely is a commitment. Um, but I think if, if you believe in the process after seminar one, and honestly, I don't know how you could see that and say, nah, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you getting through the core, I mean, that's how you do it. And we've tried yeah. to make it, honestly, we've tried to make the least amount of classes to get you to where you got to go. And so yeah. I think our core gets you there um, pretty efficiently. And you're going to be able to take care of 80 to 85% of the patients that come your way. And then the advanced curriculum is just kind of a la carte how to deal with the facial pain patient, maybe the airway patient, um, you know, other challenges, aesthetic foundations too, you know, in, improved aesthetic Scott's doing, um, you know, Witt's doing the airway stuff. I'm doing the TMD course. So there's all kinds of, you know, great stuff, but that's a little bit more a la carte. But yeah. the core, again, I mean, I think it gets you there as quickly as we can. And so that at the end of this, you're confident, you can take care of these patients, you follow the pathways, you're there. Yeah. And I would say a couple of things to, to echo your sentiments is that, you know, if you're a young dentist thinking, gosh, I can't afford to go away. There's too much going on here. You need yeah. to go away. Yeah. It's because when you go away, you can give yourself permission to be fully present at a course. You're not racing yeah. home. You can roll up your sleeves. You can be with the clinicians. You can ask them a lot of questions. And I'll tell you, you go back to your room and you're exhausted. You go to bed and you get up and you learn again. But that's the first piece. The second piece is you come back to your office and you go, oh, there's, you can see the future. Like it, yeah. it's, I call it a future poll or just some, you're excited about the future because now you can solve more complex problems and yeah. you can see a little bit further and it gives you that added, you know, that added thing that you need. Cause some of you that are watching this, you got three decades of practice in front of yeah. you. You need something to be excited about when you look at the future and learning yeah. is a huge part of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's such, I mean, that's such a great point. And you know, we, we do have seminar one and seminar two, which is the other lecture, they are online. So that does work for some people that can't travel or maybe want to cut down some of the travel, you know, so those mm -hmm. you could watch at home. So those are online and, and, and you can get them that way. Obviously the hands-on, you can't, can't do hands-on online, but um, you know, so that works out well, well for people. Absolutely. Well, Drew, I am crazy yeah. grateful. We're going to have you back for even more stuff. And I just, I love every time I talk with you, I listen, I learn, I get to learn so much and we're going to be together again for seminar one. So if you're thinking about going, don't even think about it, just go, you can hang out with us for a couple of days. You'll get super fired up. We're going to post a link to seminar one in the show notes. So you can click on it. Also, Drew, I'm going to put this in there if that's okay this book and oh, the yeah. diagnostic wizard. So you guys, if you want right. that, check it out. It is fantastic. Tons of great, great, simple things that you guys have put in here that just, yeah. it's, like I said, years and years of speeding up the learning curve for great restorative yeah. dentists. Yeah. You know, and we say that if, if anybody, you know, listening to these have questions, you know, get a hold of me through you, whatever else, happy to answer any questions as, especially as it, uh, you know, comes to Dawson Academy or any of the courses. Yeah. Awesome. More importantly, awesome. your success as a dentist, because it is a great profession. You know, love what you do, get great results. We want to have great results for our patients for a long time. Man, it's what makes things fun. Yeah. And if you, if you didn't know, dentistry is ranked number two, the number two profession in the United States. Right. And what a great way to validate it. Look at that. We're tying it all together. Yeah. Is yeah. through all these steps, you're, yeah. you know, you just embrace a long, successful path. Of, of a great life of helping people. So Drew, I'm so grateful that you, like I said, I'm grateful for our relationship, all the things that you teach, help us with. Stick around while we say goodbye to everybody and, and you guys that are watching, thank you so much for watching. Super grateful. And uh, if you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just hit the share button, share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for shows that you want to see, either that'll be separate or with Drew. I'd love to hear it. We'll do our best to get them on. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great rest of your day.